Hello, everyone. My name is uh, Jim Ketterer. I am the Dean of the School of Continuing Education at the American Thanks. University in Cairo. Welcome to our community lecture series, which in the logistics and uh, I guess the spirit of our current uh, time and crisis, we're doing virtually. But um, uh, the downside is that we can't be together uh, in the beautiful old AUC campus uh, in Tahrir Square. Um, and in Oriental Hall, which is where we hold these lectures normally. And for those of you who know that room, it's an absolutely stunningly beautiful room. So it's unfortunate that we're not there together. Um, but what's fortunate is by doing it this way, we're able to have all sorts of people who wouldn't be able to join us in person in Cairo. So that's the, uh, the silver lining in this, uh, in this cloud. Um, uh, I just want to mention, you know, for those of you who don't know AUC, um, I, I hope there's not too many out there who don't know AUC, but if you don't, uh, it's an American accredited and chartered institution that's also Egyptian chartered, um, located in Cairo, as I said, the old campus in Tahrir Square, a new campus in Cairo, um, uh, just has celebrated its 100th anniversary and is a venerable institution, and I'm very, very proud to, to be part of it. The School of Continuing Education has existed for almost the entirety of AUC's existence. It was begun in 1924. It's had different names over time, but the mission has stayed the same, to reach out to uh, the Egyptian community and society across the country of Egypt, and in fact, beyond the borders of Egypt um, as well. And uh, we offer classes um, that is such a wide array of things. All I can say to you is uh, we offer, if we don't offer it, and you come to us with a good idea, then we might offer it um, after you bring us the idea. So go to our website, um, avail yourself of, of what we have to offer, and please uh, find ways to be part of our community and our, our ensuing lectures. Um, I just wanna thank uh, for this particular event. This is the first one we've been doing uh, in this format. Uh, the, the SCE staff who has worked so hard, the AUC staff beyond SCE worked hard also uh, uh, Yulia Nandria Miller um, from Affectiva, who has been a pleasure to work with. And so that's uh, really been um, wonderful. Uh, also AUC Press, who has uh, worked with us to acquire um, uh, a stack, a, a physical stack of uh, the books that we're gonna be talking about today. So when we do have an opportunity post-crisis, we're going to have all kinds of ways in which people will be able to win free copies of that book and um, having read it myself, I can just say it's well worth it, um, even if you don't uh, win a free copy, uh, to find a way to go out and uh, to buy copies. Um, I know that they're available in Cairo because we bought a stack of them uh, from mm -hmm. AUC Press bookstores, but probably other places as well and available in other sorts of ways, but um, it's a great read. Um, in terms of this, um, our guest and, and I will be in conversation for a while, and then we will uh, open it up to questions. Um, and uh, I will moderate the questions. I'll go into the participant list. And if you have a question, uh, please raise your hand. We'll go in the order of the, 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 the questions as they're, as they're asked. Um, I'll recognize you and, and I can unmute you. And then you can ask it directly rather than me reading off a chat or something. So I'd like to have this be, as much as this format allows, have it be as conversational as possible. Um, so, as I think all of you know, we are very, very honored to be joined today by Dr. Rana El Kaliubi, who is, um, for our purposes, you know, a big part of the AUC family and has been for a long time, a lot longer than, than I have. She is an AUC graduate, twice over, um, she is also a graduate of Cambridge University where she received her PhD. She has worked at MIT. She is the CEO of uh, Effectiva, which we're going to be talking about quite a bit. And you'll, you'll learn about the interesting work that they do. She has been recognized by many different um, organizations and uh, publications, Forbes, uh, MIT, Entrepreneur, Wired, BBC, Smithsonian. That's just a short list of uh, a long list of accolades that um, keep rolling in. So we're very, very happy to have her here with us and to have her here um, at this particular time uh, that is so interesting yet so challenging 
in so many different ways, on so many different levels. And so given that, um, and given the, the challenges of these times, even before we got to, to COVID, um, uh, Rana, I was just wondering, you know, you know, amidst all the many other things you're doing, you decided at some point, I should write a book. I should write a book about the work that I do uh, and artificial intelligence. Um, so a book about the science, but I should also weave into that my own personal story. And um, it's such a fascinating read and, this, and, and I think it must have been such a, a challenge to put it together that way. And as you, as you say in the book, you, you had to dig deep to kind of reveal yourself in that process, um, in the book writing process and in the work that you do in, in AI. So I thought maybe you could just give us a sense of how that all sort of came together and how you think it resonates now in July of 2020 um, and the sorts of things that we're facing in, in Egypt, uh, beyond Egypt, and, and certainly globally, and in the United States, uh, where you and I are both located at the moment. So over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. And thank you for hosting me. Um, I do a lot of these, but this one is especially special um, because of uh, my AUC connections and, and just gratitude really for, for the role AUC has played in my life. Um, hi, everybody, wherever you are, hopefully all around the world. Um, it's one of the virtues of doing these events, uh, you know, digitally this way. Um, I just want to take a moment to acknowledge um, kind of the, the moment time we're in. We are in a moment of reckoning, both in the US and around the world, but particularly in Egypt, especially with this, um, you know, yet another case of sexual harassment. And I, and I wanted to just take a moment to acknowledge this and, and also share my experience. You know, I, I, um, I was an AUC student when AUC was located in Tahrir, uh, where, where actually the School of Continuing Education is currently located and continues to be located. And I used to take the subway or the metro into to Tahrir Square. And um, I started university when I was 15. So I was like 15, 16, 17 when I was doing this daily commute. And I just remember how uncomfortable it was people were always pushing it up against me in, in, in the subway. And even just crossing from Tahrir Square to the entrance of, um, of AUC just was always really stressful. Um, but the moment I stepped foot on campus, it was like my safe haven. It really was. And I'm actually getting goosebumps just remembering that. And I just hope that AUC continues to be the safe haven for its students, for its staff, for its faculty, and everybody that is connected to this community. And I know that I condemn sexual harassment. I know AUC condemns sexual harassment. Um, and I, I, I just, just, I'm hopeful that this is a moment where we as a community, you know, Egyptians everywhere, but also just across the world, we can come together and, and kind of um, really, I don't know, call for a, um, galvanize and call for a cultural change around that. So um, I am hopeful. It always starts with, with, you know, little steps that we can each take in our, in our, in our, in our universes. Um, so um, yeah, and, and, and actually, you know, I talk about AUC a lot in the book um, and I have, I have a few favorite stories around AUC, but, but yeah, it was interesting writing this book because it first started um, with, kind of this vision of writing about artificial emotional intelligence, which is my work. Um, but then I remember having this meeting with the publisher, with the editor at Penguin Random House, and he said, well, tell me about your story. And I was like, well, I grew up in Egypt and then went to Kuwait and then, you know, MIT, da, da, da. And he was like, that's the story. You got to weave in your story as a nice Egyptian girl and how you kind of transformed into this entrepreneur, CEO, um, and a, a real kind of thought leader in, in, in a very male dominated tech society and community. So I talk very vulnerably in the book. I, I'm very open about my experiences and I've, I've had to dig deep, as you said, Jim, it's been three and a half years in the making and I've had to really, really reflect on who I am and how I reconcile my um, Egyptianness with my Americanness, if you like. Um, 
Um, but but I'm but I'm finding that the book really is resonating with people all over the world. Uh, a lot of, a lot of aspects in the book, um, yeah, touch are universal. Well, uh, good and um, and thank you very much for that. And thank you for placing us in the context of you know ongoing events as well uh, and um, your observations on them. I think it's a it's um it makes me think of you know in the opening pages of your book where you're you're, um, hold on a second. Um, okay all right um if uh if um you know in the opening pages of your book you're talking about an empathy crisis and you have this you know this riveting scene where uh, a man um uh, drowns and uh, people don't do anything. And then you, you talk about the relationship between social media, the human interaction uh, with technology and this lack of, of empathy. Um, and uh, you know, I think we can see that play out in any number of ways, but we can also see opportunities as you were just discussing for people to kind of you know, reclaim that, reclaim that, that empathy, bring it back out of crisis, reclaim their hu humanity um, and, uh, you know, those opportunities are presented to us uh, time and, and, and again. Um, and so uh, I think that, um, you know, the current situation uh, that you were just discussing is, is one of those, but it also, you know, gives us an opportunity to talk more about your work and the, the ways in which you are working at that intersection of um, technology and humanity and all the complexities and challenges and nuances that humanity humanity brings. And so, you know, we can, we'll certainly get more into the details of, of your work and your current work and how you, you got there, but how would you, how would you just sort of in general terms for maybe people who don't know a lot about it, and I will confess I'm one of them, talk about how emotional intelligence can intersect with artificial intelligence. Yeah. Yeah, I, I want to start with like humans, right? Human intelligence. We all know that your IQ or your cognitive intelligence really matters. But we also know that your emotional intelligence or your EQ equally matters, if not more important, is sometimes more important. So for example, we know that people who have higher emotion quotients, like the ability to read and understand other people's emotions, they are more persuasive, they're more likable, um, they're more effective as, um, you know, as managers and as in, in their professional careers, but they're also um, more successful in their personal lives. So emotional intelligence really matters because our emotions drive every aspect of our lives from how we make decisions to how we learn to how we connect and communicate with other people. Um, and I believe that that is equally true for technology, especially technology that needs to interact with us on a day-to-day -day basis, like our phones, like our social media platforms, um, you know, like Amazon Alexa or Siri. All of these technologies are weaved into the fabric of our everyday lives. And sometimes even, you know, we're starting to see technology take on roles that were traditionally done by humans. And so these technologies need to understand human. They need to understand how people respond and react and feel um, to make it um, empathetic and to make it human centric. So I've been on this mission to bring emotional intelligence and this idea that technology can understand human feelings. Um, yeah, for over the past 20 years, it's been uh, a long journey. And you describe that your, your, your journey, not just um, in a career way, you know, that you, you check this box or this box or that box. But as we were talking about before, you know, you've really had to kind of dig in and reveal yourself on the page or on the screen, as it were, um, that uh, in a way that, you know, uh, you say in the book is as hard, if not harder than any kind of computer coding you've ever done to right. kind of, you know, um, to the girl decoded is um, is not an easy process. And, and at one point, I just want to read this brief quote. You say that, you know, it's en ended up where you are now as a rarity. Quote, a woman in charge, a brown-skinned computer scientist in a field that is very male and very white. 
Um, and also a big part of your story is being from Egypt and growing up in Kuwait as well as Egypt and, and uh, your interactions with your family, which uh, for those of you who haven't read the book yet, um, are really, you know, just such highlights in the book because they're so resonant. And I think um, many people, whether you're in Egypt or not, will, will understand how those dynamics, other people's emotional intelligence can affect you and what you can do and can't do, particularly when you're a child and you, you know, you have limited flexibility and agency to be able to make those decisions. Um, but this, you know, this question of being a, a rarity, uh, particularly in these, you know, challenging times in, in the United States. I wonder if you might speak to that. Yeah, I, th I think it's, it's interesting because I'm, I'm a rarity in, in like many diff in, in different ways, right? So for example, I'm one of the very few female uh, CEOs in the AI industry. Um, and, and for me, that's an opportunity to really advance. I'm like very passionate about diversity and inclusion in the tech space. <clears throat> and so I've become a real kind of voice for change um, and um, and, and again, like I'm involved in a lot of organizations that support female founders and female funders because um, we need a lot more of that. I, rem I tell a story in my book when we spun out of MIT 10 years ago and my co-founder is also a woman. She's an MIT professor called Rosalind Picard. And she and I went on this road show to pitch to investors. Um, and, and, and one strip that has a lot of investors is obviously Silicon Valley. And so we flew out to the Bay Area and did this like whole kind of road show what? where we met a lot of 30 plus investors. And um, it was just so interesting because there were, you know, two female scientists, Roz and I, uh, pitching to primarily a male dominated investor community. In fact, I don't think we met any women investors when we were pitching 10 years ago. And uh, we were pitching an emotion company. So we would avoid using the word altogether. Like it was the E word and we would never, never mention it. <clears throat> and I often wonder if there were, if, if it was more of a diverse investment community, if we had, would have felt a lot more comfortable. Um, and, 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 and it's kind of sad because I just raised, you know, a, a more recent round uh, about a year and a half ago. And it was pretty much the same. I mean, I was adamant. <clears throat> Sorry, I was adamant this time round to bring in uh, a, a more diverse investor uh, base. So we ended up with um, Motley Fool Ventures and Trend Forward Capital. Both have female partners, and they also have black people as as kind of as, as partners in in the fund. Um, so I'm very proud that we were able to bring them on board. But it's still we still have a long way to go. So I I basically I'm now on this mission to to play a, a small role in in changing the tech landscape. And it starts with the found founders, but also the leaders in the companies. Um, there's a lot of work to do. Well, uh, you know, that's sort of the, you know, the current part of the story, but a good yeah. portion of your book also is the, the, the parts of your story that, that lead up to this. And, you know, talking about emotions, I mean, I think there, there are plenty of times where you, you allude in one way or another to the fact that you were always kind of able to, you know, like control your emotions to, to be a, a very serious student and to, you know, to kind of block out a lot of other things, but that there were times when that was impossible. And, and one very dramatic time where world events really intruded on your world as a child, which can be deeply upsetting. And um, that's when uh, there was the invasion of Kuwait. You were had been living in Kuwait for a long time and then, but you weren't in it at, at that moment, you were back in Egypt and um, you see on TV as we all did what was happening, but it was happening, you know, your father was there, like what's, what's going on. And so, you know, that struck me as su such a, a resonant time because that that's not possible to control your emotions really in those sorts of moments. And the world outside seems so out of control and it, it made me feel about the times that we're living in now too, that I think many people are feeling like things are just out of control. You read the news every day um, and uh, it can be frightening at, at times, but also these, these things will pass and like, how does one get through it and, and, and deal with it? But it's, um, 
you know, that really must have been uh, tremendously um, upending in your life in many ways that, that, that to have, because it was your life. I, I do think a lot of, a lot of, a lot of that, that, you know, go, going through that experience feels very similar to the experience we're going through right now with the pandemic and everything that's happening on top of that, because there's so much uncertainty. It's so much of it is out of your control. Um, and you know, it's, it's changing every aspect of our lives, right? Like when, but back when we used to live in Kuwait and this happened in the summer, my sisters and my mom and I were on vacation and my dad was in, at work in Kuwait and all of a sudden our life as we knew it had ended, right? Um, you know, we had to find a new school, we had to find a new house in Cairo and um, I, I lost touch with my friends. Like it was really, it was really traumatic. But I remember very clearly that my parents jumped into this, let's just be action oriented, right? There was no time for just stopping or for, um, whining, right? Um, and we just, just just jumped into action as a family. Um, this time around with the pandemic, I, I feel I've become a lot more embracing of my emotions. I think it's, imp and I lead with empathy. So I, I'm a lot more vulnerable. I, I talk about why this is tough for me as a fam, you know, for me and my kids, but also acknowledging that it's tough for other people at my company. Um, and I, yeah, so my approach has changed in that I just kind of, um, I'm more willing to, to, to talk about, express my emotions both to myself actually, but also kind of publicly. Um, and I think that there's power in that. And there's, um, I found that it just invites people to also be very open and then it creates these really deep connections with others. So it's been pretty amazing the types of friendships that I've been able to form just by being so open, which was not at all what I was like as a kid. Well, and I can imagine that the process of writing this book and having to be so open emotionally in the written word um, could lead to, to that then in your, in your lived experience. But speaking of the written word, you know, at one point in the book, when you're talking about going to AUC and at first chafing a little bit at having to take courses that weren't um, in your major, having to take literature courses, arts courses, history courses, what have you, in the liberal arts tradition. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I thought maybe, I mean, the book is wonderfully written. And so, uh, you know, I think AUC could take a, a, some credit for that and uh, your experience there in that liberal arts tradition. And so I know a lot of students are worried that when they have to take those other classes, that it's a waste of time. But um, maybe you could talk about that and how that came to help you do what you do now. Yeah, absolutely. So I, I majored in computer science, um, and that was, you know, still is my passion. But I had to take, as you said, because uh, AUC is a liberal arts uh, school, I had to take all of these other classes, like philosophical thinking. Like, I was like, why do I need to take philosophical thinking? Can I just like take physics, you know, one, two, three or whatever. Um, but looking back, it's these liberal arts classes that have enabled me to be such a, such, you know, such a strong writer and communicator. The critical thinking um, aspect of it is so important. Um, and, and, it, and, it's, and it's really key when, when you are in the business world and you're trying to be an innovator or a thought leader um, and you have to kind of talk to a variety of stakeholders, right? Like in my daily job, I don't just interact with other computer scientists. I talk to, um, you know, C-level executives at Fortune 500 companies and I talk to um, civil liberty organizations about AI ethics and to be able to put yourself in other people's shoes and really engage in conversations. That's all AUC. And that's all I attribute that back to, um, you know, the way AUC approaches education. And I'm just so grateful um, that, that, I, that I was privileged and had access to this type of education. So I couldn't, and then now with my, my daughter's a senior um, at the high school and she's looking at schools and absolutely, she's gonna do a liberal arts, uh, <laughs> gonna go to a liberal arts school for sure. Good, I'm glad that the tradition will, will continue. Well, you, you're talking also about, you know, interacting with all these different other P 
people, I mean, when you first finished your PhD, and of course, during your PhD, you really were in a probably a very specialized world. And now in the role that you're in, you, you have to, to do so many different things, um, gauging other people's, you know, um, uh, um, uh, emotional intelligence, um, et cetera. But really, you know, having to be, having to be a, a, a business leader, uh, a scientist, yes, um, a, uh, an author, yes, but you, you're also having to run a business. And um, mm -hmm. did you find that at first when you made that transition out of MIT into that world that it was a, it was a, a new thing to learn? It was a difficult transition? It was definitely a tra transition. Um, I, I, I can't remember if this story is in the book or not, but when we first spun out, out of MIT, MIT gives you access to this amazing mentor community of other entrepreneurs and you know, investors, et cetera. And at the time we were raising our seeds round of funding and I got an email from one of these potential investors and he literally just said, send me your BS. And I was like, okay, the only BS I know, you can't really email, like bullshit, right? I was like, I don't, I don't know what he's talking about. So I, I, I sent this round to our invest, you know, our mentors at MIT. And one of them said, oh, he's asking for the balance sheet. And I was like, duh, the balance sheet. But I had no idea. I was so clueless. So it's been an incredible learning curve, an exponential learning curve, um, but, but, I, but I approach it with humility and I've learned a ton. I mean, there's nothing better than experiential learning <clears throat> when you're in it, right? Um, and I've raised over $53 million of venture and strategic funding from top tier investors uh, from Silicon Valley and around the world. Um, so I've, I'm very proud of, of what we've done. We actually have an amazing team in Cairo. We have about 50 people based in New Cairo and um, they're extremely critical to our success. And then we have a team based in the U S as well. Um, so I, you know, we, we still have a long way to go, but, um, it's definitely been a transition for sure. And it sounds like in, in several parts of this, um, transition throughout, throughout your story, there has been this tension between being what you referred to as the nice Egyptian girl, um, to whatever challenge you're facing at the moment, choosing your major, being able to keep your major at one point where right. you might've been pushed into accounting, um, uh, deciding to do various things um, and, and facing some really serious personal challenges in, in your life. And that kind of tension between what is the, the nice Egyptian girl and, the, and then the choices that you've made, um, I think is, is riveting and I think is, is applicable for any of us in the challenges of, of our lives. And I, um, do you, do you feel like, you know, you've kind of, you, with this book, you've moved beyond that, or is that a, a tension that continues? I think it's a tension that continues. So, um, there, there are a few moments in my life where this tension kind of became front and center. So, uh, as, as you mentioned, one, one moment in time when I was a graduating senior at AUC in computer science, I was spending a lot of time in the computer lab, sometimes <clears throat> even overnight. And one, <clears throat> I think I need water. But, um, and, and one time uh, my dad, I guess a neighbor complained or whatever, like anyways, my, my dad said, you know, the neighbors are talking. They're saying, you know, you are spending the night outside of the house and you come back at 4 a.m. and it doesn't look good. I, I used to, I didn't used to drive because I was too young to get a driving license. And so one of my male colleagues would drop me off at four in the morning. Uh, and, my, and I said, but dad, I'm in the computer lab. I'm just programming because it's like a tight deadline. And he was like, I'm sorry, change majors. Like literally when I was a graduating student, he was like, switch to accounting, I don't care. I don't know. And it was like a little bit traumatic, but my mom, I think intervened from behind the scenes and um, we were able to agree on a curfew and I graduated top of my class and it all worked out. But that was one example where, you know, my, my parents have always been pro-education and pro our career. Um, but it was an example where the cultural norms really kind of came head to head with, with my ambition. Um, fast forward a few more years, I had just gotten married and then I got the scholarship to go to do my PhD at Cambridge University. 
and uh, my parents and my in-laws and actually most of my friends were like, you can't go because your husband at the time, my husband at the time ran a software company. He's an AOC alum too, actually. And he had to stay in Cairo. Um, whereas I, I would have had to, you know, and, and, and to his credit, he was the only one who said, that's your dream. I'm not going to stand in your way. Just go. So that was another example where, you know, even though my parents really wanted me to do a PhD, it was just very, it, it was, it was against the cultural norm to just kind of leave your husband behind and just move to another country to study. So, um, and I think that continues. There's a lot of times now, even, even now, like, you know, we live in the U S but I don't let my daughter date. She's in high school. She's not allowed to date. So we, there's still a little bit of uh, the nice Egyptian girl in my head for sure. <laughs> well, well, she'll have her own book to write at some point. <laughs> right. I, was like, <laughs> right. I was like, you can complain about that in your book. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> Well, what, one last thing I wanted to, to uh, ask about, and then, then I would like to open it up for questions. And so for those of you thinking of questions, please, you can go to the participant, um, uh, click, click on participants at the bottom of the screen and raise your hand and, and I'll call on you when we get to, to, to questions. So um, in terms of your, your current work um, and um, uh, AI and emotional intelligence and all of that, the it's um, so fascinating to read about the case of Emily and Emily's yeah. child and, and autism yeah. and, and AI. And I thought you might talk a bit about that because um, we had been speaking before about, you know, humanity and technology, but I think that brings it together in a way that's really very powerful. Yeah, so, so the core technology is basically able to understand just using a webcam or a camera on your phone, um, your facial expressions, right? Are you smiling? Are you frowning? Are you smirking? And then there are so many applications of it. The very first application we explored is in autism. So individuals on the autism spectrum, they really struggle with understanding um, nonverbal communication, like your facial expressions or your gestures. Uh, and in fact, that often results in them avoiding face and eye contact altogether. Like they just won't even look at you and look you in the eye. So they miss all of these signals and it's quite detrimental. You know, as kids, it's very detrimental for them in school, but of course as adults, it's even then harder to get a job or, or have a relationship. Um, so what we built was a, 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 a Google Glass like device with a little camera facing out and we connected it to the software and in real time, it processed the expressions of other people and gave you real time feedback. Um, so it would help the kid, for example, understand what other people are feeling. And we tested this in a uh, school for autistic kids in Providence, R Rhode Island, when I was at MIT. And now we're partnered with a company called Brain Power and they are using our technology in Google Glass, because when we did this, this was before Google Glass existed, um, but they're now commercializing it and they are, they're deployed in about 450 homes in the US, helping kids with autism develop these social skills. Um, so that, that's, that's an example where, to your point, technology can really help elevate our emotional intelligence and really help us become more emotionally intelligent and autism is, is, is a great example of that. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm looking through the participant list. I don't see any raised hands. Um, so I hope you know how to do that. I, oh, well, here is um, uh, uh, one question from Rehab. So let me unmute you and please go ahead and ask your question. Uh, good evening and thank you so much for the webinar. Um, Rania, I, Rana, I would like to ask you, um, I feel you're shifting from your uh, main work by writing this book. Do you think that a shift in career is a good thing or um, or you think you're not really shifting from your career by writing this book? Do you think think you are shifting, and do you think you it's a good idea for somebody to shift? Um, I'm a teacher, and I'm rethinking of what I'm doing. I want to shift a little bit from teaching um, and um, become a trainer, a teacher trainer. 
I love the idea. I've done it um, once, and um, I'm not sure. I'm so <laughs> afraid to continue with it, and I'm not really sure whether I should venture into that. So yeah. what do you think? What do you think? That's a great question. First of all, I, I would say do it. If, if it feels like the next uh, step in, in your journey, you should totally take it on. Um, you know, in the book, I talk about outgrowing your dreams. I feel that that's happened to me a few times where I, ha I was fixated on a dream. And then, you know, I get to that point And now I want to kind of move on to a, an even bigger dream. And I feel like with the book, to be honest, um, it is starting, you know, just based on the feedback that people have given me from the book, I feel like I have an opportunity to influence um, what people think about AI, but also leadership and, and young talent in, a, in an entirely new way. And so I'm doing a lot of soul searching, to be honest, about what's next. Like, what do I do with this book? And, and uh, where, where, where do I go next with all of this? So, um, so I, I'm probably in the same stage that you are at rehab a lot of a lot of soul searching a lot of imagination but also a lot of trepidation like oh can i just like you know yeah, yeah. So, good luck <laughs> thank you so much thank Bye. you okay i think we have another question um hold on one second so this is from it says english for medical students I will unmute you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Kaluga, I very much enjoyed uh, uh, what you gave uh, and also what um, Dr. Kettle uh, mentioned in this give and take that you had both together. Very interesting. Uh, my question is, um, what is the extent that AI can be used in diseases like depression or other uh, disease, as you know, for the time being, uh, you have patients that will see maybe two or three doctors and they will follow a standard operating procedure, each one individually classifying these patients, and then uh, we'll come together to try and work out, uh, you know, basically from what the uh, persons answer the questions, how they will proceed. And I was wondering, I was, very, I was very interested in what you said about AI and to what extent do you think in the years to come, uh, will AI um, be able to diagnose, uh, at least in some cases, the type of um, mental disorders that um, uh, patients can have? Thank you so much for asking this question because this is something I'm very passionate about. So. You know, when you go to the doctor today, they don't ask you, what is your temperature? They just measure it. But in mental health, the, the gold standard, as you just said, is a survey. You ask people, oh, like from a scale on one to 10, how depressed are you? And it's so subjective, right? Um, with our technology and technology like ours, we know that there are facial and vocal biomarkers for stress, anxiety, depression, Parkinson's, can quantify it we can bring data to the table where we can see like based on the different facial expressions if people are exhibiting signs of depression and given the number of hours that we are spending on our devices anyhow it's an amazing opportunity to capture that data of course with people's um, permission and quantify like what is your baseline so that if you start to see a person deviate from that baseline you can flag that to the person to a family member to a clinician. Um, so I think that's, honestly, there's so much potential for, 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 for impact and, 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 and change in, in bringing data to mental health. Yeah, thank you. That was a, that's a great question. Uh, probably a subject for another conversation, but it does make me think too about what, once collected, what happens with that information? Uh, how can we make sure that people can feel confident that, you know, very, very deeply personal information that's being collected about their mental state is not being um, shared uh, uh, without their knowledge uh, and maybe not with all um, positive ends. So there's no. Yeah, that's um, a definite. Yeah, there's definitely data privacy and, and control over your data is a huge topic in AI and technology, obviously, in general. And I think we need Again, it's another example where we need leadership here because we need 
tech companies to be more transparent and more forthcoming about how this data is going to get used. And, and honestly, I feel like the consumer needs to be in control of that data and we need to see a shift in this power asymmetry, right? The power right now stands with the tech giants and a few governments and we need to see the power. Um, <laughs> Does Fatma have a question? <laughs> Great. It was a big time. It wasn't part of a question. I don't know. Um, I, and I okay. So, yeah. we, we do have uh, now a question from Salma. Let me uh, unmute. Salma? Hello? Yes, welcome. Uh, uh, first of all, I would really like to thank you both of you and Rana, you are a huge inspiration to myself. Uh, so just like an intro, um, I'm an AUC alum as well. I graduated uh, from actuary science. I was at the top of my class, but uh, thank you. But now I feel I'm in the soul searching lost stage. And since I'm still in the beginning of my career, I don't know, like I've always been so good at school because there were like things to follow. So things were clear. But now venturing out into the world, I feel like I, I don't know the next steps that I should follow. And how, how like being in my footsteps like uh, years ago, how did you uh, manage that? How did you know which step to go? Because I think it's like a domino effect. Like you make a step and things just like follow through. Um, so yeah, I don't know, like my dream would be to like, of course, go to MIT because like I'm now very much interested in the data science and the AI world uh, mm -hmm. more than the just insurance actuary science side of things. Um, so yeah, so I'm just like, how should I think about my career and the next steps I should follow? And I have like a second question as well, because like uh, going to the, um, uh, to the, sorry, to the person who just asked the question. And I, I actually like been part of, or like uh, I saw um, uh, articles being done like bit on a huge scale with like a lot of international donors. And they were interested in this in measuring or surveying a psychological well-being test. And they always use the WHO5 uh, well-being index. Mm -hmm. and, um, as a young scholar, as myself, I've always thought it's, it's very subjective and I don't, like I understand WHO is a very prestigious institution organization, but at the same time, uh, the, the results or the data, it's just like very biased, it's very influenced. Uh, it's like, it reminds me of what we took back in AUC uh, as a loaded question. It, uh, and that's a big trap. So yeah, sorry for just like going <laughs> on forever, but uh, I would love to hear your response to all of this to chit chat. <laughs> I'll, I'll start with the second part of your question or your second question, which is um, back to kind of this idea of quantifying mental health and, and making it a lot more objective. Um, I, I, I think we, you know, we need a paradigm shift and it's going to take a lot of work and a lot of uh, stakeholders, again, uh, the, the importance of, of, of um, doing work cross boundaries and cross disciplines, I'm finding is so critical. So I, the only thing I would say to you is if this is something that interests you and it sounds like it does because it, you're up to speed on a lot, of, a, a lot of what's happening in that space, that's an area where we need a lot of young people and a lot of innovators and just a lot of creativity and new approaches. So maybe that's a place you can dive into. And then kind of segueing into the first part of your question, honestly, don't try to, don't try to, um, how do I say this? Don't try to plan it 10 steps ahead. When I started my PhD at Cambridge, it was Cambridge, UK, right? Cambridge, United Kingdom. And I was Googling and this Cambridge MA kept popping up, Cambridge, Massachusetts, where MIT is. And I didn't know what this was. And I was so annoyed that, you know, Google didn't know that I was going to the Cambridge UK, like the Cambridge, right? And fast forward a few years later, it was where um, I, my first home in the United States was, right? And so um, 
the place where we're at right now, I mean, I never would have imagined that I would start a company. It was not my career goal. So my advice, I guess, to you would be just think of the next step ahead, like start with one step. And maybe that's, you know, graduate school, if you're not quite sure where you want to be or um, uh, get your hands kind of get some hands on experience in a company that you're curious about. Um, if MIT is really the goal, then absolutely go for it. And you can you know, message me directly uh, afterwards and I'm happy to help, but, but take the first step would be my advice. Good luck. Okay. Uh, so we have now a question from uh, someone whose sign on name is a little bit unusual. 2E20522C. Uh, so Hello. Hi. Hi. Please go ahead. Yes, welcome. Uh, hi, Jim. This is Fayel from India. Okay, yes, please go ahead. <laughs> welcome. Yeah, uh, I congratulate uh, Rana for such an outstanding and pioneering work in this field. Um, Rana, I have been attached to gender studies for a long time and uh, do write on various kinds of gender discrimination and uh, feminist movements. So would you, uh, I don't know, I haven't read your book uh, yet. So I just want to ask you, have you ever, like uh, uh, concentrated anything on this uh, EQ uh, study, um, like for understanding gender relationships and discrimination? Um, so if you can just... Uh, uh, on this. Yeah, yeah, we, we've done, um, thank you for the question. We've done a lot of work. So we have data from 90 countries around the world from about nine and a half million people, which is like 4 billion data frames. It's just a ton of data. We've started to do some cross-cultural exploration, especially around gender differences. So we found that women almost across the world um, exhibit more positive expressions than men do. Men do a lot more kind of stern and, and kind of ne more negative oriented expressions, which is interesting. We found that, um, it's interesting. I don't know if we have any people from the UK tuned in, but we didn't find any statistically significant difference between men and women in, in the UK, which I thought was interesting. Um, so we started to do that. We've looked at, we had an intern one summer who was really curious about um, women, like gender dynamics in political conversations. So she analyzed, you know, hours and hours of political debates that involved women. And she looked at how often women got airtime, how often did they get cut off. Um, so I thought that was interesting, but um, I haven't seen a lot of work kind of being done there. I think there's a, that's a great, that's a great use of the technology to really quantify these um, dynamics and, and gender um, yeah, gender dynamics. Well, I think we have time for one more question and that will go to uh, Karima. If I can, okay, Karima, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Please um, go ahead. Yeah, thank you very much, um, James and the runner for this uh, nice session, uh, nice talk. Um, as uh, both uh, a mother and uh, as well someone who has been in the field of juggling work between work and study and kids and things. This is very inspiring. Thank you. Um, my question is about um, the process of writing because uh, as Rana mentioned, she is a graduate from computer science um, of course, uh, your English is perfect, uh, I can see, but the idea is writing uh, is more than just writing thoughts. Uh, you, said you have been in the writing process like for three and a half years until you get the whole book ready um, for people to read. So can you give us a little bit of insights about how you manage about writing and uh, managing uh, writing the style? Uh, all the printing and publishing issues that you have faced. Yeah. Like sure. for, 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 
Yeah, because everybody, I have some interesting um, <laughs> incidents in my life and everybody I meet and keep talking to them, they say, you should write your story in a book. So <laughs> as well, I'm thinking about it. So uh, if you can inspire me how to do this, um, I would be very grateful. Thank you. Yeah, you, you, you absolutely should. Every story and every voice matters. Um, I, I think that I, I have two kind of pieces of advice. One is just the discipline of it, right? Like um, I was on a, on, a, on a very clear schedule um, and um, I think it's really important that you, you stick to that schedule and just like write a little bit every day. I've been journaling for many, many years now um, and I've, I drew a lot of content from my journal. Um, I was able to go back and, and look at well, how did I feel when I first moved to the US? Like, what did it feel like? And I, all of that I drew from my journal. So I, I would advise you to, to kind of just, just, just write openly, right? And then, you're, and then you, are, you can organize that later, I guess. Because um, it's easier to play around with the content once it's there. Um, and then the other piece of advice is just, um, I don't come from the publishing industry, so I didn't really know what it's like. And, you know, there's a lot of work that's needed to sign on a publisher. Um, you have to have a critical mass of the book or at least a book proposal ready. Um, and then once you have the, the publisher signed on again, you're on a strict schedule. Um, but actually I didn't realize the amount of work there is once the book is, is submitted um, and just kind of all the work that's needed up to the book launch. Um, I just had no clue. So there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of work that goes into publishing a book from, from marketing perspective and a positioning perspective um, that was, um, yeah, that, that, that I had underestimated. So it's a lot of work, but it's definitely worth it. Uh, again, happy to share my thoughts um, one on one if that's helpful, but good luck. Well, with that, I, we have come to the end of our time. We've really only just scratched the surface. Um, I want to say to everyone, uh, first off, uh, thank you for all joining us from all around the world. And um, secondly, uh, I really highly, personally highly recommend the book, Girl Decoded. Uh, I urge you to go out and get it. You're not going to be able to put it down. It's a great read. And, uh, and as I said, uh, uh, the School of Continuing Education um, is going to be having some uh, prizes and things like that where we have copies of the book, but um, make sure you, you go get your own copy. Um, I, I really do recommend it. Uh, Jim, I was, Jim, I... Yes. I was saying, I also, if people are into it, you could um, get it on Audible or other like audio platforms. Um, yeah. Oh, yes. Thank you. Available. Thank you for, for mentioning that. Um, I'm so old school. I was just saying, go get the book. But uh, yes, <laughs> I need I need to update my uh, my references. Um, well, to Dr. Rania El Kaliobi, it's uh, been an absolute pleasure to have you with us at the School of Continuing Education in this virtual way. And I hope that you can come visit us in person when we're all back in person. Return to your Tahrir campus and, and come see us that. and, and uh, <laughs> another event that we can have in person the next time that you are in Cairo. So thank you very much. Thank you to everyone. Thank you to everyone who helped to organize this. Um, it's really been a pleasure to, to convene this way and I hope everyone stays safe and stays well. Thank you so thank much. You. Thank you so much, Jim. Thank you, everybody. Stay good. Okay. Bye-bye. Can you see this? Can you see this? I'm going to put it in my hand. Can you see this?